For Christians, sinful behavior is inconsistent with our identity in Christ. That's not who we are. He has changed us and we're a new creature in Christ. So what happens when we sin very publicly in a really profound way? What happens when an unbelieving world doesn't see Jesus in us? Can our testimony be restored? Can our witness ever have credibility again? Join us today as we look at a story from the life of Abraham, a story from Genesis 20 and 21, a message entitled, Restoring What's Lost. Take your copy of God's Word, if you would, and let's turn to the book of Genesis chapter 20. We're going to be in Genesis 20 and 21 today, and um, continuing our series, Learning to Trust God. And as we get started today, um, I'm going to get Micah to come up and help me. Micah's going to come up and tell you guys a story. I've asked Micah to do that, okay? So he's going to come and get this. This is my youngest son, Micah, for those of you that don't know. Micah, I want you to tell them the story about when you broke your arm. Just tell them about that night. Tell them about what's, what was happening. Tell them how you broke your arm. So in Joseph's room, there's a little hallway between the door and his room. And we used to, like, put our feet out and our arms out. We used to climb up and we'd just, like, sit there and we'd hang there. And back then, we used to watch Ninja Warriors. And I saw the door frame. And like they used to like swing on the bars. So I'm like, hmm, maybe I can do that. So I, so I tried. It didn't work, so I fell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I fell, and my elbow hit the ground. So I ran to my dad, and it was, it was Christmas. I remember that because I ran to the kitchen, and he was in there, and he, we have this little glass Christmas tree, and he's putting in little ornaments. And he's, he's like there, oh, it's just bruised. You're fine. And then... <laughs> It goes on, we eat dinner, and anyways, and then I'm going to bed, I'm hugging him goodnight, and he's like, oh, wow, your arm's really swollen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go to the hospital, and we get an x-ray, and my arm's broken. <laughs> Good dad. That's what we do. So what you're learning is, we climb the walls, and we swing from the door frames, and we, yeah, we don't worry about the injuries. Ah, you're just bruised. It's fine. Put a little tape on it. Get back in there. So tell them, okay, so you got, we, we went to the hospital. They took the, uh, they took x-ray. Your arm's broken. So tell them about other things that they did at the hospital. Tell us what you remember about the hospital and the, you broke it. Now tell us how, tell us how it got fixed. <laughs> well, we, What'd they do at the hospital? Tell us about what they did at the hospital. At the hospital, they 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 took the x-ray and then they told us to go to a different place because that was like it was like a specialty for kids okay. with like injuries i'm not really sure i don't really remember we did go to a different place mm -hmm. and then we went there and then they said we did another x-ray <laughs> and then they put on the the soft stuff and then they put on the hard stuff for the cast yes Okay, do you remember how long you had to wear the cast? Two or three months. I'm not really sure. Okay, it smelled great, didn't it? No, it did not. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and so, obviously, your arm's better, mm -hmm. right? So, this gets us to the point of the story. Give me the microphone, and I want you to sh just hold your arms out for them. Just go up there and hold your arms out for them. Obviously, you use both of your arms, right? And so, the whole point here is, is that right now, if we were, Micah just told you that story, but if he holds his arms out to you, you wouldn't be able to tell which arm was broken. You've all seen Micah function. He could hold that microphone with both arms. He, he uses both of these arms, right? Which arm was broken? This one. this one. Ah, but see, you didn't know that, right? Because his arm was restored. You can go and have a seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
So I got Micah up here to kind of introduce our message today. And if you have not been with us, what we're doing is we're looking at the story of Abraham. And this is the next, to, this is the last Sunday we're doing. But this is the next to the last chapter in that story of events that happen in Abraham's life where he's learning to trust God. And Abraham's story is our story. Um, Abraham was justified. He had a sinful nature. He was, he was in, over there in Ur. He was called out of that. He was justified by faith. And what you learn through the story of Abraham is he, God is developing his faith, and, and we can have victory over sin. We can have victory over that old nature. What we've seen in salvation, what we've seen in the life of Abraham, and what we have seen in our own life is God can take what's broken, and he can restore that. That's what happens. Today, is an, is especially that's, that's especially seen in the story that we're going to look at because Throughout this story of Abraham's life, we've seen moments where he obeys and moments where he disobeys. This is one of those stories where he disobeys, and it's, it's familiar. It's going to be familiar to other times that we've seen Abraham's life. So if, if the, the title of the message today is Restoring What's Lost. Because the idea of the message today is what happens when a man of God, like Abraham, sins in a very public way? What happens when you as a believer in Jesus Christ sin in such a public way that everybody knows it, everybody has seen it? What happens when your testimony has been damaged by your sinful actions? Can it ever be restored? We know as believers that we have watched God take a life that was ravaged by sin and we were on our way to hell. We were broken and defeated by sin. We've watched him bring us out of that miry pit and restore a life that was broken by sin. We've watched that in salvation. But then there's these moments where we fail in front of our family. We fail in front of our coworkers. We fail in, we fail in front of people who need Jesus. And then we start to have doubts about that. Our faith begins to waver in the sense of, can God ever use me again? Is it, is, will my testimony, can it ever be restored? Can my credible witness for Jesus ever be restored if I'm not if I have at one point not been a good representative for him, it's all lost. Today we're going to read a lot of scripture. Let's start in, in Genesis chapter 20. We're going to read all of this chapter. Stay with me. So from there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she's a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister? And she herself say, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things, and the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've done these things, you have done to me these things that ought not be done. Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there's no fear of God at all in this place. He'll kill me because of my wife. Besides, and she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do for me at every place to which we come. Say of me, he's my brother. And then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. And, Sarah, and, and to Sarah he said, Behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. 
It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female slaves, so they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So we finish reading this chapter and think about Abraham's testimony in front of Abimelech. We should think about our own testimony today. And the question I would have for you is, what kind of person do they see? What I want to do in the outline today is describe three, three types of people, th- three things that they may see in you. And I think it's, I would encourage you today as I walk through this outline to ask yourself, what are they seeing in you? The people you work with, your neighbors, your lost family members, what are they seeing in you? The first thing I would ask you, uh, the first thing that they could possibly see is they could see a dishonest man. What you find of Abraham in this story is you, in the first section, I'm going to focus here on the first seven verses, you see Abraham presenting himself in a very dishonest way. Now, we're familiar with what Abraham does in this passage, aren't we? The passage tells us that he goes to Gerar. He leaves the place where his altar had been built, and he moves to another place if I were to go into all the details and had time for that, I might, I might talk to you a little bit about the location of Gerar and all that. But what's really important here is Abraham leaves the place where the altar is and moves to another spot. Isn't this a lot like what happened when he went to Egypt? He left the place where the altar had been built and he went to this pagan place, a place where they did not fear God. He decided to move into that region And he left that place. This has so many commonalities to the story of when they went to Egypt after the famine because it's in both cases that Abraham begins to walk by sight and not by faith. And he begins to revert back to this old lie. It's a lie that he had concocted evidently when they left Ur, right? He he presents it in the passages like this would be something that they would go back to. We've already walked through this relationship and how this was really like a half-truth. But when Abraham feared for his life, he would say, just lean into the you're my sister part, you know? Lean into that and let's tell people that you're my sister and not my wife. Let's, let's give this appearance of things. Now, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the story and maybe you've lost sight of the timeline. But Sarah is not young. You know what I mean? I saw a meme or something uh, uh, the other day it was a it was a picture of Dolly Parton when she was young you know I mean Dolly Parton's beautiful you know that 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 young Dolly Parton and the the caption next to the young picture of Dolly Parton said what in the world did Jolene look like you know like, what would Jolene have had to have looked like if this is what Dolly looked what Jolene look like you know when you think about Sarah like this is a this is a fox of a lady She's past 90, and Abraham's worried that people are going to steal her. And they do, right? They do. That's what, that, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what Sarah looked like, but, you know, seemingly by what's presented in Scripture, she was an extremely attractive older lady. And so Abraham goes back to this comfortable lie, and, and, and when you think about all the things that Abraham gives us here, when you think about the way that he presents it, he has grown in his faith. This is not a young man. We might think that, okay, Abraham's been following the Lord for several decades now. Abraham, has, he's been trusting God in this promise. God has been developing his faith. Surely at this point, he wouldn't make the same mistakes that he would make as a younger man when he just started following God. That's just not true, is it? Those of you that are in the room that have been a believer for 25, 30, 50 years, you know that the struggle with the flesh is still a real thing. We still have this sinful nature about us. Anybody that tells you that you come to this place in your Christian walk where you reach some kind of perfection, where sin is not an issue anymore, mm mm-mm. That's why we must renew this relationship with him day after day. We must must take up our cross daily. We must die to self and we must come to him every day because no matter how long you have been a believer, you are just as susceptible to the same things as when you first came to Christ. 
when you think about what's going on with Abraham here, this is proof of that. And so when you think about the idea that sin, you may think that sin would disgust you as a believer, and it should. But what begins to happen is, is that, that is, as we maybe slip away from the Spirit, as we begin to live in the flesh, as we begin to answer the desires of our heart, as we begin to walk by sight and not by faith, we do just what Abraham did here. We slide back into a familiar old pattern. The very fact that this comes again and again is something that evidently wife stealing was a problem everywhere, right? But also it's a place that shows us where Abraham's faith is still not there. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's, there's somewhere in your life right now where the Lord is still trying to sanctify you, where that sanctification process is still happening. And if you're a believer who, who wrestles with the flesh and who falls to temptation, that doesn't mean that you're not a believer. It means that your sanctification is not complete. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. You know that old song? This is what's happening with Abraham. Abraham is a man of God. And so when you think about what you see here, he presents himself as a dishonest man. When you think about a person who is a believer, who is not acting like a believer, two things are possibilities. One, that person is not really a believer. The Bible is very clear that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are those who think they're believers, who claim to be believers, yet at the same time, they didn't genuinely come to Christ. More on that in the coming weeks. But there may be a person who claims to be a believer but is not behaving as a believer because they're really not a believer. So their, their behavior is consistent with an unregenerated person because that's what they are. In that case, you have a dishonest person. You have a person who is claiming to be a believer, but yet they are not. But the other case could be that if, if you have a believer who's behaving in a sinful way, it could be a person who's genuinely given their life to Christ, who's genuinely come to Christ, but this behavior, because they're wrestling with the flesh, because their sanctification is not complete, their behavior looks like an unregenerated person, but it's inconsistent with who they are in Christ. Really, they're in Christ. And really, their behavior should be that of the new creature that they are. They have taken off the old and they have put on the new. All of those New Testament epistles talk about this and discuss this sort of thing. Tell us to put off that old and to put on the new. And to now that you are in Christ, behave this way. Don't behave this Don't behave that way because you're in Christ. And when you came to Christ, you put all that aside. That's not who you are. And so if you have a person who's claiming the name of Christ and yet behaving in a different way, in one of those two ways, they're dishonest. They're going through life, claiming one thing and acting another. It's dishonest. For those of you that are around the room, just knowing most of your testimonies, you are believers in Jesus Christ. You profess to be believers in Jesus Christ, and I believe that you are. I've seen the fruit of that in you. And so when you go out here this next week, and you're with coworkers, or you're at the ball field, or you're you're, you're you're having a discussion with your neighbor or whoever, and, and, and there's this thing that comes out of you that's not you, the Holy Spirit gets your attention and says, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not who you are in Christ. And you experience that conviction of the Spirit. It's because you're presenting yourself in a dishonest way. You should be representing Christ. And the very fact that that sin is evidence of a dishonesty, that that's not who you are anymore. You're in Christ. What Abraham's doing here is, 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 is not, uh, obviously not godly, not uh, anything of integrity. And so they could be seeing The Spirit. They should be seeing the Spirit if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But the problem is is that they could be seeing a believer who's allowing the flesh to hold sway in your life. What are they seeing? Are they seeing a dishonest presentation of who you are? The second thing that they could possibly see is a disgraced man. I, I believe that every dishonest man will eventually be shown to be a disgraced man. Right? This is this is a portion of the story where 
you find, I guess I'm going to focus here on verses 8 through 18 of this particular chapter, because Abraham, when you look at this chapter, it's, it's not his best hour, is it? In fact, if this were the only chapter that we had in the whole Bible, who would you say is the godly man? If you're just reading this text, you would say Abimelech. In my notes, I wrote, Abraham was a liar, Abimelech acted with integrity. Abraham was selfish, Abimelech was generous. Abraham willfully chose sin, God kept Abimelech from sinning. Isn't that interesting? That in this text, you have you have Abraham who's choosing to disobey God, yet you have this man Abimelech who's supposedly a pagan king who when God speaks, he obeys. That's what's happening in the text. And if this was the only passage that we had, you would think that Abimelech was the man of God and Abraham was the pagan. That's not how it is. In truth, what we know by reading the rest of Scripture, by reading the rest of the story of Abraham, we know that God was chastening Abraham in this, that he, that Abimelech is actually condemned. As we're reading this text, he's, he's condemned. When you think about uh, Abraham, like we shouldn't minimize what Abraham is doing here, but these men had two different standings before God. Abraham had been chosen by God and was, and was a man of God who was, try, who was attempting to live for God. What you have in Abimelech is not that. Abimelech is not a believer, is not worshiping God. You'll see even later on in the, in the text that we'll read that, that it's Abimelech who is, is, is in need of, of, of this message of what God can do in Abraham's life. In verse 7, It calls Abraham a prophet. In spite of God's, in spite of his lie, God would use Abraham to to help Abimelech and to and to be a good witness in front of Abimelech eventually. But what you see happening in this moment is that Abraham, because of his behavior, is disgraced. The dishonest man. If you think about the Christian who's behaving in a sinful way, it's almost like he has blinders on. Right? He, this Christian's living his life, and, and he, he doesn't even realize the way that his neighbors and, and people around him are seeing him. They're, he's not even realizing the deception that he's giving off. But when that deception, when his eyes are open to it, which Abraham's are, what happens? He's disgraced. He's, disgr- he's a man who claims to know God, yet has not lived or acted as God would have him to, and it's apparent to everybody. I want you to imagine in this story what happens when Abimelech and Abraham have that face-to-face moment after God has spoken to Abimelech. Can you imagine the shame that Abraham feels in that moment? As, as Abimelech is saying to him, notice some of the things that he says, and what you have not done, verse 9, you have done this thing to me that ought not be done. And when Abimelech says that, Abraham knows that it's true. He knows that it's true. Imagine that feeling of shame and guilt in this. A.W. Pink says, Sad indeed, inexpressibly sad was Abraham's conduct. It was not the fall of a young and inexperienced disciple, but the lapse of one who had long walked the path of faith that here shows himself ready to sacrifice the honor of his wife and what is worse, to give up the one who is the depository of all the promises of God. This is where Isaac would come, right? Warren Risby talking about this says, God in his grace will forgive our sin, but God in his sovereignty must allow sin to produce a sad harvest. And if you're a believer who, who knows Christ, and yet doesn't represent Christ well, it's only going to bring shame to you. It's going to bring shame to the name of our Lord. And it's it's not going to help those who don't know Christ to come to him. One of the saddest parts of this story, and I don't don't know if I included the scripture or not, but I'm not going to read it for time's sake if I did. One of the saddest parts of this story is if you were to continue reading in Genesis and you get to Genesis chapter 26, Isaac that son of promise, 
he finds himself in a similar situation. And do you know what Isaac ends up doing? Exact same thing his dad did. Exact same thing. You know, last week we talked about how Isaac had, how Abraham's faith had not happened in a bubble. It had not grown in a bubble. Abraham's mistakes didn't happen in a bubble either. And, and one of the saddest things was not just the shame that he felt in front of Abimelech, but that, that, that Isaac, Isaac wasn't here to watch this, but that Isaac knew these things about his dad, and he knew that it was a familiar pattern to fall into. I'll go with dad's old lie, old lie you know? And he, he's following in the footsteps of his dad. First, we're blind to our sin. We think it's the best way. Our willful pride keeps us from recognizing the shame of what's happened. But when it's exposed, we find ourselves disgraced and shamed like Abraham did. Our unfaithfulness is apparent. And in that moment, we've been a bad ambassador for Christ. We failed our master, and we know it. And there's a lot of emotion that comes with that. There's this feeling of hopelessness. In that moment, we feel like we've messed up and our testimony is beyond repair. We think that our lost friends and family will never be saved because we'll never be able to share the gospel with them. God can never use us for anything again. It's like the prodigal son coming back home to the father and saying, I don't even deserve to be your son. Just let me stay with the servants. Why would anyone think that our faith is genuine? after such a public failure and disgrace. You know, this por portion of the story, if we think back to when the, the previous account where this happened with Pharaoh in Egypt, this is really where the story ends with Abraham, isn't it? He's dishonest with Pharaoh. He's disgraced in front of Pharaoh, and he ends up going back to Bethel, and um, it, there's, there's never any opportunity for Abraham to make that right with Pharaoh. But this account's a little different. This is where we begin. Up until this point, everything we've seen happen is very similar, isn't it? It's the same story of Abraham's failure. But this is where the story changes. Because one of the things that God does in this moment is that God gives Abraham an opportunity to re for things to be restored, for his witness to be restored with Abimelech. Now I need to tell you, I need to tell you this. Abimelech is not so much a name as it is a title. For instance, this story, I believe we're talking about the same Abimelech. So we're fixing to read some in, in Genesis 21, and I believe this is the same Abimelech, okay? But remember I told you Isaac made this mistake and also told the same lie that his dad did, you know? And when you read that account, it, he's also telling it to Abimelech. But it's, it's Abimelech Jr. in that case, right? So th this Abimelech may be more of like a title than a name, but in, the, in, in this case, it's the same guy that Abraham is having dealings with. It's the same thing that's happening. And, and I want us to read for a little bit in Genesis 21 because what we're going to see is the third, what they should see in us is they should see a devoted man. They should see a, a man or a woman devoted to the Lord. And, and Abraham is going to get that opportunity. From what we just read in Genesis 20 to what we're fixing to read in Genesis 21, as many as four years could have passed in between these two events, and despite all of the failings that you find in Genesis 20, Abimelech is going to come to see Abraham as a man of God. You'll see some evidences of it in the text we're fixing to read. Let's pick it up in Genesis 21 in verse 22. We'll read another good stretch of scripture here, okay? It says, so at that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. That's a huge verse. After all the failures, notice what Abimelech notices. God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or my descendants or my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who's done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand 
that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Notice as we started that passage in verse 22 that Abimelech and the others in the area began to notice what was going on with Abraham. Through the course of what's happened, he notices and knows that Abraham is a man of God. Now, obviously, when you get down to verse 23, he, rem- he presumably remembers what Abraham had done in the past because he said, swear to me that you're going to shoot straight with me from now on, right? Abraham, that's what verse 23 says in the DBV, right? But he, in verse 22, he recognizes that, that, that God is with him. Think about everything that he's seen. When you read through the course of this, they have watched a fellowship with the Lord. They have seen God provide bounty and blessing to Abraham. I don't know if you know it or not. We have missed the reading of this because we've jumped around in this story a little bit. You know what's happened between Genesis 20 and Genesis 21? It's the birth of Isaac. They have watched this beautiful senior citizen give birth to this baby, this miraculous baby, and and this miracle child has come, and so they notice in all that you do, right? God was able to restore Abraham to a place where it was a positive witness for what was around him. And Abraham, in this alliance, in the things that you see happening in this story, what you see him doing there is you see him doing for Abimelech the same things that God had done to him. In the story, did you notice there's a well of water that Abraham dug, and, and obviously water in that part of the world was scarce, and so if you dug a well, also, you know, you had to guard that well, and other people would. And so what happens is, is that some of Abimelech's men have come and taken this well, and are using it, controlling it, whatever else, possibly with violence. It's not really conveyed in the text, but that's what you get. And so he goes to Abimelech and he says, man, they've, they've seized this well and they're using it. No, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. No, we don't know if he really did or if that was, you know. Oh, I didn't know. You know, I don't know what Abimelech was doing. But he, didn't, he says he didn't know. But then they make this covenant with each other that Abraham is going to get that well back. And just as kind of the broad strokes of that agreement, did you notice some of the things that happened there? There was a solemn, a solemn covenant that happened by the giving of those animals back and forth. There was a blessing that was given in the ewe lambs. There was provision and refreshment given as he plants that tamarisk tree. Think about all of the things that God has done for Abraham. Do you remember the covenant that he made with the animals? Do you know the blessing that he has promised? Do you know the provision and the constant reminders and encouragement that's coming? Everything that God had done for Abraham, you see a picture of it, a mirror of Abraham doing that for Abimelech. It's obvious at this point that his testimony has been that his testimony has been restored, and what Abraham wants to present to Abimelech is the everlasting God. Do you see it in verse 33? There he called on the name of the Lord El Olam, everlasting God. Now these names for God give us a point of his character and, and they're, they're pertinent to the story. And so when you think about what's going on here, Abraham is trying to, it seems as if Abraham is trying to turn Abimelech onto, okay, I'm, I'm a follower of God and I'm not faithful. But the God I serve, the God I'm not faithful to, he's always faithful. That's where he's trying to point him. He's, all, he's always there. He's always faithful. And that's where he's pointing him. Warren Wiersbe says of this particular section, he says, wells would disappear, trees would be cut down, ewe lambs would grow up and die, altars would crumble, treaties would perish, but the everlasting God would remain. In this moment, what you see is God giving Abraham an opportunity to behave in a godly way to Abimelech. And listen, I don't know where you are, but I know that as, as, as I just sit here and I just speak to, to us in this room, I know, we know each other. We've known each other for a while. We know our failures. You have seen me not represent Christ well, and I have seen you not represent Christ well. And in every instance, in every instance, 
God can take what is broken and he can restore it. He can take what's he can take that moment that you thought that you destroyed your testimony beyond repair. And listen, he can even use that moment to reach other people. Did you hear what Teresa shared in her video today? I came to Christ as a girl. Then I started partying. I started using meth. I started making meth. I got clean as a Christian and went right back to it with prescription stuff. Got my sister involved in it. Got sober. And it was through all that that God spoke to her and said, you need to get your act together. You're ruining your testimony for me. And what is Teresa doing right now? <laughs> She's not, probably because she's a backsider, but that's a whole different story. No, she, she had something come up this morning. She, she called She had something come up this morning. But, um, but she is right now faithfully serving here. She's serving our church. She's serving our children. She's serving those ladies at the jail. She's serving those ladies at Restore. And the role that she has there is, is more effective because of that failure in her Christian walk. God is sovereignly using even the mistake that Teresa made to restore her testimony and to bring her back to a place where he can use her, right? Some of you may be familiar with the story of Alfred Nobel. Um, it, it's a story that I've, I've heard before and some of you may have, but Alfred Nobel was a chemist, inventor, all of those things. And he was a, um, he's credited with dynamite, you know, like as the inventor of dynamite. And the story goes that at some point along the way, he, uh, his brother died. And the newspaper got that wrong. The newspaper thought it was him, thought it was Alfred that died. I think his brother's name was Ludwig, and, and his, his, his brother's the one that had died. But the newspaper printed the article, and when the newspaper article ran, it said, the merchant of death has died. This inventor of this explosive, this explosive material that, yeah, can be used for all kinds of constructive things, but also used in warfare. And as this merchant of death, he's dead. Alfred Nobel read this newspaper article, and he was like, oh, if this was me, if I had died instead of Ludwig, this is how they would remember me, merchant of death. And from that moment on, he began to consider what people would think about him after he died, and he began to change everything. He had a, all of, a, of his fortune went to, these, went, went to go into this fund, into this trust to be able to fund these prizes that would celebrate the best of the things that humanity had done. And so m many people that recognize the name Alfred Nobel, like the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, many people don't even connect that with the dynamite story in The Merchant of Death. Because effectively what he did with his, with his memory, with his testimony or his witness is, it was changed. He, re, he reversed it by the things that he did. There were things that happened where, where we don't remember him for that. We remember him for the Nobel Prizes that are given away every year in his name, right? Very much like this story of Abraham and very much like our story, was reading this man named James Strahan. This is his quote, but it's, it's wonderful for us to close with today. He said, men are not to be judged by the presence or absence of their faults, but by the direction of their lives. For you and I, as we sit here today, your life is headed a direction. For, those, for some of you, you may be here and you may not know him as Lord and Savior and your life is lived in in everything but a godly way. Maybe as I began to talk earlier and you begin to think about, you know what, I'm, I, it doesn't matter what I say about, about what I profess to be a believer, my life is not lived like a believer. It could be that you are a believer and the Lord convicted you in that moment and said, here's a thing that you do and that is not consistent with your character in, in Christ. What's the direction of your life that you're showing? Maybe you have come on the heels of a huge disgrace. Maybe you can think about something in your life that was, it was not your finest moment. Just like Abraham, it was the moment where if they would have seen you, if somebody would have seen your life and seen what you would have been doing, and they had just seen that sliver, just that little window of history, that, and you would have asked them, is that person a Christian? They would have said, no way. Anybody have a sliver like that in their life? Yeah, me too. Me too. 
They've said there's no way that person's a Christian. What's the direction of your life that you're showing them? We like to think that we have the power to destroy our testimony to the point that it cannot ever be used again. That's a lack of faith in a God who's trying to develop our faith and show us that he can restore anything. He can restore anything. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as we begin a time of invitation, when we started this service, I had Micah come up and share about his broken arm. He told you about the evidences that his arm was broken, the pain, the hurt, the swelling, the way it looked funny that evening. He told you about when he went to the hospital, the things that they did in, in, in restoring that arm, the x-rays they took to diagnose the problem. You know, it could be that today what's happened as we sat in this service is that, that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, has x-rayed your heart and said, man, there's a fracture right here. Maybe you know there's a fracture, but you, you don't believe that he could ever restore it. Maybe today you would come and you would allow God just to, just to use his Holy Spirit to, to just wrap that cast around your life and just to hold you in his sway and just to, if, when you can't be strong for you, let him be. When, when you have problems being faithful, say, God, I, I can't be faithful, so I'm going to surrender to you because you are faithful. Our salvation is not based on the things that we do. But once we come to Christ, he calls us to good works. And if you know him as your Lord and Savior, yet you don't show that to the world, you're not fulfilling the great commission by even just your actions. Lord, today we long to be a people who follow you, who serve you, who honor you with our lives. And Lord, I pray if there's one here in the room that their life seems broken beyond repair. Lord, I pray that we would see you today as the everlasting God who restores all things. Lord, reveal yourself to us now in a way that we would respond as you're calling us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.